housekeeping items. Uh, so first, let me, I'd like to welcome everyone to episode 16 of Office Hours with Dave and Anita, um, Delayed Spring Growth and Cold Damage in the Vineyard. Uh, today's presenters are Con Curderall, Mark Batney, Larry Bedica, and Matthew Fidelibus. I'd like to thank you all for attending today's program, and we're going to begin shortly. I'm going to start with a few housekeeping items, as I mentioned. All right, if you would like to ask a question live, we've received a few via email, which we will ask, and there's a couple ways to do it live. You can type the question into the chat box or you can raise your hand in Zoom by clicking on this reactions button and then clicking on the raise your hand right here. And then we will call on you to ask your question, but remember, if you wanna ask a question, you have to unmute yourself so we can all hear you. Um, please stay muted during the presentations so that phone calls and private discussions do not interrupt the presentations. We also wanna let you know that closed captioning is enabled today. So if you go to this closed captioning or live transcript button down here at the bottom of your screen, you can turn it on and off depending on whether you want the closed captioning or not. We'd like to thank our extension partners. Without their support, we would not be able to bring you programs like these throughout the year and especially during this past year. We'd like to thank our speakers for presenting and answering questions today and a shout out to Con Curderall for suggesting this office hours topic. I'd like to thank Caroline for taking care of the logistics for this meeting. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I do want to mention um, that Anita Overholster is listening by phone. Uh, she had a last minute appointment that she could not avoid. So she'll be listening, but I will be co-hosting with uh, David Block, who I'm now going to turn it over to. And he is the chair of the Department of Viticulture and Enology here at UC Davis. And he will introduce the speakers and then he will hand it over to Khan. And I will stop sharing. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here for this program. It's been a, a while since our last one. So it's great to have this one here. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to thank uh, the people who actually organize this event uh, with Khan. That's Karen and Caroline. Welcome Turner. to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID, followed by pound. There we go. You <laughs> mute yourself um, uh, if you can while you're not speaking. So I'd like to thank Karen and Caroline for organizing this event, putting all this together. It doesn't happen uh, by itself. So a big thank you to them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, and then turn it over to them so they can uh, talk and answer your questions. Um, so first of all, our first speaker will be Khan Curderall, who's a Cooperative Extension, Extension Specialist in Viticulture in, the, in our department and based at our Oakville Station facility. Our second speaker will be Matthew Fidelbus, who's a Cooperative Extension Specialist also in Viticulture in our department based at the Kearney uh, Ag Research and Extension Center in Parlier, California. Our third speaker will be Mark Batney, who's a farm advisor in uh, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Um, and our fourth speaker will be Larry Bettiga, who's a viticulture farm advisor in uh, Monterey, Santa Cruz and San Benito counties. So we're very happy to have all of them here with all of their experience in this area. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Khan um, to start our program. Thank you. Unmute myself as usual. Well, thank you to all uh, who signed up and uh, to all the uh, speakers who have uh, agreed to uh, present at this uh, event. I think uh, as usual, uh, we are a little bit late uh, responding, but uh, uh, our schedules uh, did not allow uh, to uh, tend to this uh, as soon as uh, we saw it. Um, I know I did uh, quite a few uh, farm calls up in the North Coast, uh, so did uh, all the other uh, uh, folks that are on this call. So it's a timely issue and uh, I will uh, get us uh, going. So each of us uh, will present uh, for uh, you know five to uh, seven minutes. Then uh, we have some questions uh, that we have uh, received. And then uh, we will uh, answer uh, the uh, questions uh, that you will uh, ask us live as 
previously. So I'm going to talk about uh, carbon partitioning in the grapevine, how it may uh, lead to a delayed spring growth. Uh, we are not just uh, unique uh, in California. We are seeing this uh, up and down the uh, Pacific uh, coast. Uh, there has been a shift in the climate in coastal and central California. We have little to no cloud cover. We have intermittent heat spikes, as you uh, are well aware. Uh, today it's 109 at uh, Oakville, hotter in uh, Davis, hotter uh, elsewhere probably. We have a general warming trend, and we have no appreciable uh, increase in our uh, precipitation uh, supply. The grapevine has uh, sources and sinks. Uh, we uh, pay a lot of attention to the sinks for some reason, not too much attention to the uh, sources, which are the leaves. Leaves make the uh, photosynthesis. Uh, they will be transported via to the uh, phloem in the form of uh, soluble uh, sugars or carbohydrates. They'll be assimilated either to the uh, berries or to the uh, perennial portions of the plant and they will be uh, stored. Non-structural carbohydrates, they are remobilized and transported uh, during the spring, but they will accumulate from June on and their uh, accumulation will peak somewhere between uh, September to October and then it will uh, utilize during the uh, winter as the uh, buds uh, uh, respire. Uh, water availability. Uh, I have uh, two citations here, and uh, I have uh, will list them uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, these presentations are available to the uh, attendees. Water availability is the determining factor for cell growth, photosynthesis, and redistribution of these carbohydrates between the uh, source and the sink organs. And of course, due to climate change, we are seeing an increase of winter temperatures. This results in earlier uh, growth initiation, erratic bud break, and spring frost. And of course, the type of uh, pruning you do, if you are still uh, doing a uh, cane pruning, you should reconsider it. Uh, Matthew Fidelbus uh, will talk about this in uh, greater detail. Uh, this is affecting the uh, local carbon budget at the bud. Uh, you are, we are seeing biomass increases, respiration, and autotrophy transpiration. The transport of our uh, non-structural carbohydrates, the contribution of our uh, xylem and the phloem is changing because uh, this temperature has an effect on our whole vine uh, physiology on the local carbon budget, transport, synchronism of our uh, growth resumption, but the signaling, the local genetic control of phenology and our uh, cold acclimation is necessarily coming from the stems and the root local carbon budget, which will uh, drive growth, respiration, and our uh, storage and our uh, resiliency to our uh, stress during the uh, dormant portion of the uh, year. Uh, how can our carbon assimilation be impeded leading to a late spring growth? We're seeing uh, applied water amounts uh, affecting this. Of course, our source and relationships. To add another, uh, to throw another wrench into the uh, cogs, we have other, other abiotic factors such as uh, these uh, wildfires that we are uh, seeing. Largest influencer is precipitation before our bud break as far as our applied water amounts are concerned. The exchangeable currencies during the growing season are uh, affected. Spendable currencies uh, during the dormant season are also affected. This is of course affecting our percent bud break, cascading down onto our fruitfulness, then to carbon starvation. And uh, we summarize this uh, in a previous paper where we did the work in uh, uh, Kern County where precipitation before bud break the amount of our water stored in the uh, soil, uh, in addition to applied water in the season, will affect these uh, later on. Uh, Non-structural uh, carbohydrate composition is highly dependent on our uh, grapevine uh, organs. Total soluble uh, sugars, the exchangeable currencies, are going to be uh, mostly in the leaf, as you will expect. The more you irrigate, the more uh, exchangeable currencies you will have. In the shoot and in the root, the exchangeable currencies uh, do not move around uh, too much. When we come into the uh, expendable currencies, such as uh, starch and percentage of dry weight, of course, the more we irrigate them, the more there's availability in the leaves. When the shoots and the roots in our mature plants, they're somewhat uh, stable throughout the uh, rest of the season. Apart from the fruit, total soluble sugars are mainly accumulated in the uh, leaves at a harvest accounting about 90% of the total leaf non-structural carbohydrates. 
And if you are looking for a biomarker for fruitfulness in the uh, next season, the amount of our raffinose accumulated in the leaf and the shoot is what determines it. If you are uh, looking at it uh, through the course of the season or some sort of another biomarker, our uh, water use efficiency of the uh, crop is going to be affected by the applied uh, water amounts very strongly. We can measure this with the abundance of uh, uh, C13 in the must at the harvest. And this is the most reliable uh, method that we have to assess this uh, as the uh, seasons uh, go on and uh, get warmer. If you are around that uh, negative 25 and a half uh, C13 uh, abundance uh, in the must, you are uh, you know, in a deficits, you're not going to be accumulating uh, enough non-structural uh, carbohydrates in the grapevine for continued uh, 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 fruitfulness. When we look at our source sex relationships, the larger influencer is our leaf area. It determines photosynthesis speeds and our storage compound capacity. Crop level determines exchangeable currencies, such as number of clusters, but speed of ripening and carbon starvation and its uh, leaf area is going to be uh, determined by the leaf area you keep on the vine. Uh, very simple, uh, if you are, uh, you know, uh, remove 66% uh, of the leaves, uh, the uh, grapevine uh, is not going to uh, accumulate, is going to uh, try to uh, uh, accumulate a lot of carbon because it's uh, starving. Likewise, a stomata will be uh, open. Uh, it's going to, uh, you know, try to take in, uh, as much water as possible. When we look at the dynamics of uh, starch and our uh, soluble carbohydrates uh, in the roots, the relationship is uh, reversed. Whenever uh, there's fruit ripening uh, happening, if you are a uh, carbon starred with a less than ideal uh, leaf area, such as people doing a uh, lateral removal, excessive uh, leaf removal, you are not going to be accumulating uh, starch in the roots to get ready for the season. Luckily, uh, we are in a you know, warm climate in California. We can't catch up uh, lately. But if you look at the uh, exchangeable currencies uh, in the grapevine roots, the relationship is uh, completely uh, reversed. Since the carbon is, since the plant is so starved for our uh, carbons due to improper uh, practices at some locations, uh, they're uh, really not uh, you know, happy. Again, uh, this is uh, something uh, that we started uh, seeing uh, more and more in the uh, North Coast, uh, berries uh, aborting due to lack of carbon because people are doing this uh, naked leafing, not leaving, uh, not taking care of uh, you know, leaf area or uh, you know, correct uh, applied water amounts. We are seeing uh, berries abort, but uh, once you remove the uh, you know, crop load uh, influence uh, out of these uh, systems, you see that the uh, more leaf area you have, more functional leaf area you have, the faster the speed of uh, ripening uh, is, uh, regardless of uh, seasons. Qu uh, question comes up, are the fires uh, affecting us? Yes, they are affecting us. Uh, this is us uh, harvesting our uh, plots. Uh, this photo was taken at uh, midday. Uh, it was kind of eerie. Uh, so we looked at the uh, speed of uh, photosynthesis uh, with the uh, ash on or uh, ash off. With the ash on, uh, we are seeing that uh, you know photosynthesis uh, you know are uh, quite uh, impeded. As soon as I remove the uh, ash from these uh, uh, leaves, uh, photosynthesis just uh, takes off and uh, uh, saturates. Likewise, uh, in this situation, when I have ash on the leaves, I uh, expose the leaf to a uh, different amounts of uh, light. Okay, with the ash on, uh, it doesn't uh, still photosynthesize. But as soon as I, uh, you know, wipe the ash off or uh, wash it off, uh, photosynthesis uh, recovers. So in our findings, uh, we are recommending right now, uh, I mean, we do manage uh, vineyards at our uh, University of California as well. We are using our post-season uh, analyses uh, in the form of our must C13 analyses. If this is uh, you know, greater than an abundance of uh, 25 and a half uh, C13 abundance, uh, we are irrigating our post-harvest or uh, trying to do our groundwater recharge with the uh, ability we have. Our post-harvest uh, irrigation with micro-irrigation uh, has been successful at 12.5% uh, of our ETO. We are avoiding our post-season fertilization except for potassium. Uh, we have started using post-season uh, water footprint uh, analyses and our pruning in our uh, mechanized block had to be adjusted uh, under these conditions. Box prune grapevines, they do need uh, leaf remo uh, shoot removal. 
we are thinning them to uh, seven shoes per foot for reds and about uh, 11 shoes per foot for uh, whites uh, in our uh, vineyards uh, that we manage uh, for uh, uh, income. Uh, here's some uh, resources. This will be uh, available to you. Uh, C13 analysis uh, done as a service at a, a stable isotope facility in uh, Oakville Station. Water footprint calculations, uh, you can uh, uh, get them uh, here uh, from this uh, link. Then uh, I will make this uh, available. Uh, and then I will stop my talk and then I'll give it back to, uh, turn it over to uh, Matthew. Okay, thank you, Khan. Sorry, I'll share my screen here. And Matt answered that question that was in the chat. He actually answered it in the chat. Cool. Okay, so we have, as Khan mentioned, uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, we've also been seeing a lot of delayed spring growth problems. The farm advisors have been asking me a lot of questions about it and also growers. And we also saw some at the Kearney Agricultural Center this year. So the appearance of delayed spring growth, it's usually observed on young vines. They're particularly susceptible to this. It's uh, expressed as poor bud break and delayed shoot elongation. So often what you see is a lot of bare nodes with the other nodes having just a, like a little rosette, a little puff of leaves that often will just stick there uh, and not grow much for a while. It's especially common on canes and particularly in the middle of canes. So here are some vines uh, that we saw at the Kearney Ag Center this spring. Uh, vines on freedom seem to be particularly susceptible to this in our experience. And uh, these vines were cane pruned and you can see in the middle of the cane, we have a lot of bare uh, section here where either the shoots are delayed in growth or they came out and died or they never came out. Over the years, it's become apparent there are certain factors that seem to increase the likelihood of delayed spring growth. One is having young vines. The other is certain varieties and rootstocks. Cane pruning, as we just mentioned, is also something that tends to be more, vines that are cane pruned tend to be more affected than those that are spur pruned. Overcropping the season before can lead to delayed spring growth, as can late harvest. And excessive late season growth is also uh, contributes to this problem, as do warm fall temperatures and dry soil in the fall and winter. So if you look at this list of things that seem to really uh, uh, consistently be related to delayed spring growth, a lot of them have to do with carbohydrate accumulation or the need for carbohydrates and also water availability, especially over the winter. Here's another picture of that same vine but uh, taken from a different angle here, this is Sun Prime on Freedom Rootstock. And uh, they're quadrilateral cordon trained. So this is the other, uh, they're going to be, so this is the other cane of that vine. Uh, but in the background here, this much larger canopy, these are the same age, the same variety, but they're own rooted, whereas the ones in the foreground are on Freedom. And so that shows the effect that rootstocks can have on this uh, problem. Another big contributing factor is weather. And fall of last year, at least in the San Joaquin Valley, the temperatures were warmer than average in the fall and there were no hard freezes over winter. So if you look this, I apologize for my uh, jumbled uh, axes here, but what these are is daily, either uh, average lows, which are these blue circles or average highs for these particular dates. Uh, between October 1st and March 15th. So the averages are dark colored uh, symbols. And then these light colored symbols are the actual temperatures in 2020 on these days. 
So you can see throughout October and even into uh, November, we had higher than normal highs and higher than normal lows. So it's pretty warm uh, fall. And then over the winter, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we did have quite a few low temperatures that were lower than normal, but they were not particularly cold. The lowest one that we had was 29. Uh, and some of the daytime temperatures were actually higher than average. But we had almost no precipitation in the fall or early winter. So here are uh, precipitation data for Parlier, uh, for the Kearney Agricultural Center. And this should be 2020, not 2021. But uh, October, we had no rain at all. November, we had a quarter of an inch. And December, we had uh, just over half an inch. And you compare that to the average values for these months for Parlier. So quite a bit uh, less rain than we used to have. And in fact, that's actually been noted in a recent research paper that California's rainy, se rainy season is starting nearly a month later than it did 60 years ago. So uh, what they're saying in this uh, paper is that in over time, the rainy season is uh, getting later and later and in these drought years, you've had fewer big storms. So the overall effect is less rain and skewed toward the end of winter and into spring. And that's really too late, I think, to avoid uh, dry soil related problems with delayed spring growth. So uh, that's why irrigation uh, post harvest and in the beginning of autumn is really important for avoiding as much as possible delayed spring growth the following season. There's certain varieties that people have made notice seems that are more susceptible than average to delayed spring growth. So just a sampling, it's not an exhaustive list by any means, but Thompson seedless, crimson seedless, red globe, uh, some raisin varieties, Selma Pied, Fiesta, Sun Cream. Uh, here's some wine varieties, Chardonnay, Merlot, Grenache, Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, they all seem to be particularly susceptible. So if you have young vines, you're cane pruning them, you're having a dry fall and winter, uh, you probably need to be thinking about, uh, you do need to be thinking about irrigating. Uh, Freedom and Harmony are especially susceptible rootstocks. So I remember uh, soon after I started, one of the first farm calls that I went on with uh, Pete Christensen was to a raisin vineyard of Fiesta on Harmony on a sandy soil. And we went out in the, in the spring and, you know, the, un unfortunately, this vineyard is very, very, very badly affected by delayed spring growth. Uh, and so it was, it was quite a, a loss for that person, unfortunately. Uh, so normal growth from dormant buds requires rehydration and also vascular development. So the dormant buds, they actually are become dehydrated over the course of dormancy. That's a freeze protection measure. And they also have relatively weak vascular connections with the vine. So in the spring, it's important for sap flow, uh, which is often referred to as bleeding. That process is important in helping resolve any embolisms that may have formed over the winter and also re rehydrating the buds. And I think Khan pointed out in his presentation that uh, the xylem at times can play a role in providing organic materials to uh, different parts of the plant. And this is one of those times uh, as the, the buds are rehydrating and basically being fed by this um, bleeding sap. And the bleeding for it to occur uh, as it should, it depends on the buildup of root pressure. And root pressure is uh, the results of carbohydrates. It results from carbohydrates and other organic compounds being deposited into the xylem and thereby increasing osmotic pressure and water uptake from the soil. And so when you're lacking in carbohydrates or the soil is very dry or both, uh, then you're, you may not have, uh, this bleeding may not occur to the extent that it should to help get the vines off to a good start in the spring. Uh, because those vines, uh, once again, they do need to be rehydrated and they also need some time to develop uh, new vascular connections with the vine to support growth. So therefore, when you have irregular bud break and stunted shoots, it suggests that there's insufficient reserves or vascularization to the bud. So that's why I think 
these delayed spring growth symptoms are really similar to other uh, other environmental uh, factors that can damage the the vascular system and uh, inhibit this process, inhibit either of these things, either uh, reducing the amount of reserves that are available, as um, Khan talked about, or uh, the ability for the vascular tissue to uh, work properly. So carbohydrates, water, minerals, they're needed to resolve uh, these embolisms, as we mentioned, rehydrate and feed the developing shoots. And uh, vine age, cultural practices, and weather, they can all affect the vine's ability to provide these uh, things that are needed. So it's really best to prevent DSG, if at all possible. And uh, some things that you can do uh, or consider doing, depending on the season and your situation, are uh, to think about pruning severity and crop load and make sure that they're consistent with the vine capacity. Also, it's important to maintain the canopy in good condition so that you can get an optimal amount of assimilates uh, to uh, store the carbohydrates, carbohydrates that you need uh, to avoid delayed spring growth. And so part of that is effective disease management, for example, powdery mildew. Uh, also irrigation and nutri nutrition management that maintains the canopy, but uh, doesn't promote late season growth is also important. And uh, after the vine has ceased growth for the season, you also want to take a look at soil moisture and consider uh, refilling that profile if it needs it. So what's the prognosis if you had delayed spring growth problems? I think young vines with poor bud break or greatly delayed growth, they may need retraining. Uh, you may have to take off those canes like I showed you before and replace them. Otherwise, you have permanent bare spots, perhaps, in the cordons. Uh, in severe cases, you may actually need to replace the vine um, if they are really badly damaged. If sufficient shoots resume growth without too much delay, uh, then maybe no action is needed. Uh, there's some vines that I noticed at the station that had delayed spring growth this spring. And now, if you went out there and looked at them, you wouldn't know. They looked uh, poor and delayed and stunted for a few weeks and now they're fine. Uh, but even so, the fruit yield and quality is reduced on some of these, these shoots that were stunted. We see some hens and chicks uh, on some of those uh, shoots, even though the shoots have resumed growth. Uh, but even though the vine will uh, somewhat uh, adjust its capacity in terms of dropping fruit and so on, you could still end up with severely uh, on severely affected vines with an overcropping situation. I think one of the people who uh, sent in a question on email mentioned that their clusters were bigger than their shoots at this point and the shoots weren't really growing. Um, that's a bad situation to be in because you are going to be overcropping the vines probably. And then you may be lacking again, this at the end of the season in reserves, carbohydrate reserves. And if you overcrop, you could reduce fruitfulness and predispose the vine to delayed spring growth again. So uh, Khan asked me to just briefly um, mention a few uh, slides, at least uh, about related to fruitfulness and the fruiting cycle of vines, just because some people I think are seeing some of these uh, lower fruitfulness with delayed spring growth. Um, they're seeing fewer clusters anyway, they're seeing sterile shoots. So uh, how does this work? Well, I think one of the reasons why you might not might see sterile shoots on vines with delayed spring growth is that the vines that are severe, the, the shoots that are severely stunted, they actually will uh, absize the clusters. And that was something I meant to point out in one of those pictures that I had uh, that showed the, the shoots up close because uh, you could actually see, uh, I'm not sure over Zoom, but looking at the original photo, you can see the scar on the shoot where the cluster absized. So the clusters will sometimes simply fall off on those, on those shoots. Um, but what's important to keep in mind uh, otherwise, if that's not the problem, is that clusters that you see this spring, they were actually formed last year. So this year out on your vines, uh, at this time of the year, in the axle of leaves and on attached to these uh, lateral shoots that form in each leaf axle, you'll see what's gonna become the primary dormant node uh, if you don't print it off in the winter. 
And within these structures here, these nodes, there's actually a shoot being uh, preformed. And even on the shoot, cluster primordia are being made. And so this is just a diagrammatic uh, thing showing you roughly uh, what's going on in this two year cycle. Next year's crop in terms of flower cluster initiation and development is occurring uh, between bloom and verasion for the most part. Uh, and so what's happening out in your vineyard now is gonna affect next year's crop. So certainly by winter, for sure, you have all of the uh, preformed shoots in this node and there's three, there's a primary one, a tertiary and a, a secondary. And they have all whatever clusters that they each could bear, there's cluster primordia for those in place. Uh, here's a, a vertical cross section through that bud. And you can see a flower cluster here, for example, just waiting to come out the following spring. And this slide is a complicated slide. I won't go into it too much, but um, in here, uh, it's just describing all of the different um, environmental and biological factors that can influence uh, cluster formation on in buds on my, on the shoots and buds. And one of the important promoters is carbohydrate content. Uh, the assimilates available to those buds as they're making their decision to. Uh, form clusters or not. So that's all I wanted to say. And I think I went over my time. So uh, I'll yield and try to stop sharing my slides here. OK. Um, I think uh, Mike will talk a little bit about the uh, cold hardiness. We have uh, questions uh, coming in uh, as we're uh, typing. So Mike has the uh, uh, cold hardiness uh, aspect and uh, Larry will have the uh, management aspect uh, towards the uh, tail end of uh, this. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mark Batney. Great, thank you, Khan. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit more on the, the cold acclimation process here. Um, this is a, a similar chart to what Khan had showed, um, maybe a little simplified version of it, but I think it bears to be repeated uh, just because of the importance of this relationship between the non-structural carbohydrates over the uh, season and how they change and the importance of their recuperation. So if you look at this chart, uh, prior to bud break in the winter, we have a fairly high level of non-structural carbohydrates, either the, uh, the fuel uh, of the vine. After bud break, decreases quite rapidly, reaches a low level around flowering, and then increases gradually over the rest of the season, whereas by dormancy, hopefully we have uh, refilled that, that uh, level of storage carbohydrates. Uh, these carbohydrates have two key purposes for us. One thing, they're fuel for the next season's growth, but also they have a very important role for cold acclimation. You know, we need these higher levels of storage carbohydrates to make sure that the cells can survive cold temperatures. So here's an example of what we see when the uh, vines suffer from uh, our, our typical cold damage. And I think a lot of people are seeing something similar this year. So oftentimes in these younger vines, uh, very poor or non-existent growth on, on the uh, cordons or spurs. And oftentimes we do see growth coming out of the sucker positions, whether it's the scion or the rootstock. And often very um, inconsistent patterns within the field. So some vines heavily affected, others much less so. So I, I want to give you an example just to, to demonstrate the impacts that cold temperatures can have and the role of the acclimation of vines as far as suffering damage. So back in 2013, we had a, a very mild fall. Uh, these are some temperatures that I was measuring, uh, measuring the air temperature at one foot above the ground surface. So really a, a very accurate uh, measure for understanding what young vines were feeling. Um, temperatures never fell below freezing until the first week of December when they dropped to about 15 degrees very quickly. So these are the ideal conditions to cause lots of damage to very young vines. So there was a, a vineyard very nearby where I was measuring those temperatures and they had a really interesting example of uh, the susceptibility of young vines. They had two different situations. They had planted in the middle of the summer uh, green potted vines, so something that we often do. And when you plant vines at that time, these potted vines, they don't grow a heck of a lot. 
um, but they make just very modest growth. They had also planted dormant bench grafts, which in the middle of the summer, that's pretty darn late to be planting those. Um, those vines, those dormant bench grafts grew like crazy. Because why? Because they had a lot of fuel in that uh, wood that that bud was attached to and the temperatures were high and had lots of water. What happened when we hit those cold temperatures like on that previous chart, the following spring, all of virtually all of the dormant bench graft vines were dead and virtually all of the green potted vines survived just fine. So what was the difference? The difference was the acclimation. So the dormant bench grab vines were examples of vines that were growing very, very strongly late in the season. And as a consequence, when that early cold hit them, they did not acclimate prior to that. So they suffered very severe damage. The green potted vines, because they were growing much more slowly, they entered into the dormant season with a much uh, higher level of acclimation. And therefore, when that early cold hit, they survived just fine. So it really uh, points to two things, you know, how susceptible vines that are not acclimated can be to cold, but also how resistant acclimated vines are to cold. Um, and that was a pretty severe change in temperature that we saw prior to this event. Here's another example from a different year. Um, in this example, a large field, these were vines that were going from second leaf to third leaf over the winter. Temperatures really didn't get that cold, down to about 25 degrees, but didn't fall below that. But yet they saw widespread damage, more so on some rootstocks, 1114 and SO4, as I recall, suffered worsely. Uh, 1103P at this site did not suffer as badly, but still widespread damage. But what was interesting, there wasn't similar damage observed at this scale elsewhere in the region. So again, this points to the importance of having vines which are well acclimated to cold prior to going into dormancy and the issues that happens when we don't uh, reach that acclimation. So what are the causes of poor acclimation? And you know, the presenters here, uh, Matthew and Khan, have already gone over some of this, but I think it bears repeating. Uh, strong late growth, like the case with the dormant bench grafts, when they're growing very strongly into the fall, their resources are going into those growing points rather than storing the carbohydrates in the permanent tissues. So that is a really bad problem with trying to acclimate. Spring frost. You know, if we have a spring frost, we're starting the season with a much lower level of storage carbohydrates because the vine has to start over um, regrowing tissue. So it's at a deficit for carbohydrate storage so that can then have consequences over the next year. Overcropping, water stress, anything that causes loss of functional foliage, whether it's disease or leaf hoppers or us removing foliage. And then finally, early fall frost. So if we have a situation where our vines are still actively growing, we have a frost that drops all the leaves, even though that may not be the frost that causes damage to tissues, it stops that accumulation of the carbohydrates and then makes those vines more susceptible to suffering if there is a more severe cold event uh, somewhat later. So that's all I have for you and I will pass it back the baton here. All right. It's Larry now. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience that I've had with uh, shoot stunting on the Central Coast and, uh, and maybe give you a few ideas how individual growers have uh, dealt with some of this. And again, just to kind of go through, we've covered a lot of these things, but oftentimes it is difficult to uh, distinguish what exactly is happening. And, and so like Mark and the others just said, uh, there's a lot of factors that can influence uh, maybe the carbohydrate levels in plants. And because of that, oftentimes then vines can be maybe more impacted by cold at temperatures you would uh, not normally expect. And so it, it sometimes it, it is hard to put a finger on it. Uh, again, we have some years where we have these historically, um, you know, low uh, either fall or winter temperatures. And so like Mark mentioned, 2013 was one. Uh, again, we went through uh, one in, in the Central Coast in, in uh, 99, the winter of 98, 99, which was probably one of the 
very low, lowest ones I've ever seen as far as these cold temperatures. And again, it was a time we were developing a lot of vineyards and we had uh, severe problems with some of those vineyards, especially the ones that were, like Mark said, uh, planted late or also the ones that were in training. So especially in year two or three, those vines have a, you know, people are trying to push them oftentimes. Uh, often the other thing is the young vines just don't slow down and mature their wood as readily as a mature vineyard. And again, that's why you see more damage in, in these vineyards. And so when that happens, you really have to evaluate, you know, how severe the damage is and, and how you're gonna manage that vineyard may vary uh, based on that. So this is kind of the classic one. Uh, this was a photo I had taken many years ago. And again, the, these cold things, the, the, the damage oftentimes can be somewhat erratic. And so here you see a vine that's severely stunted versus one that has a relatively uh, normal looking canopy. Again, because you know, cold air moves uh, like water and, you know, you typically you see the damage and the stunting more severe in, in uh, low areas. And, and then the recovery oftentimes is, is, is uh, slower uh, depending on the extent of the damage. Uh, again, there is a rootstock effect like Matthew mentioned. This one happens again to be, these are I think uh, third leaf vines. Uh, you see on the left 3309 is more stunted than the vines on the rock 1103. And again, we've seen a very strong rootstock effect in a lot of different areas of California. I had the, I guess, the fortune uh, to have a rootstock trial in one of these cold spots in Southern Monterey County. And so we, we saw some of these events. And so this is uh, average shoot length uh, in, in two different points in time in June, uh, and then came back in September. And so again, you can see uh, uh, 3309, uh, 110R, 420A are, are more stunted than things like 1103. But also there, there's, there's some of these vines, they will be stunted, but they'll recover. And so you see freedom is actually relatively, in this site was relatively stunted, very similar to the ones that had more severe stunting. But by late, uh, early fall, that those vines had recovered. And so although they were stunted, they did recover. And so maybe less impacted than these vines that stayed with relatively short shoots for, for the entire season. Again, there is a yield uh, a loss when you have these cold events. And so here you see in 99, uh, this vineyard was planted in 92. So this is uh, from, from 95 to 2005 was we followed this vineyard. And again, we saw this uh, re severe reduction in yield. Again, it's more severe where you have more stunting, uh, less severe of a reduction in things like 1103. Again, there's a slow recovery, they're back up. And then there was another event uh, again at, at this site. And so again, you see this up and down per, uh, reduction in, in productivity due to cold events. Again, in, 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 we, in uh, 98, 99, when we had very low temperatures uh, in, in, in the central coast, we, we saw a lot of vineyards. Again, most of these were young developing vineyards. And so we actually went into this vineyard. And, and so th these are actually vines the following season. They were already, they were stunted in 99, but we came back in in 99 and, and we're following some of these vines. And so again, you can sometimes categorize these by vines that are growing what we think is normal, have actually good shoot growth, relatively uniform shoot growth. And then ones that are, are maybe stunted, but still have active shoot growth versus some of these vines that have severely stunted shoots uh, and, 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 and have this sort of appearance. And so we, we dissected some of these vines and again, we can correlate the, 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 the degree or the severity of those symptoms with damage to the, to, the, to the trunks. And so again, vines that had no symptoms, we don't see any visible uh, damage to those, the, the xylem tissues. But where we do see damage as that becomes more severe, you see a greater uh, degree and a further um, 
down or, or from, from the top down to, towards a graphene that damage goes. And so again, the very severely uh, damaged vines, we're, ha we're seeing a lot of uh, trunk injury uh, and, and, and a loss of, of uh, maybe the potential for that trunk to conduct water. And again, you see here uh, an association of lower carbohydrate levels in those damaged vines. And so the recovery and, and maybe the, especially in these younger vineyards, I mean, there are times we have to say, are those vines able to recover? And when they're severely damaged, oftentimes those vines need to be uh, pulled out. And in, in other years where you see, like Matthew, I think mentioned, he sees vines that were stunted early and that they've recovered. On those vines, typically those vines have the ability to, or have, have their xylem tissues uh, repair themselves and be functional enough to get more normal shoot growth. Uh, and maybe those vines are gonna be less impacted uh, than when that damage is more severe. Again, I think what the, the best thing when you start to see those shoots or those slow coming out, it, it, are the tips still growing? And so when the tips are still growing, there's always the potential if those vines can repair themselves, you'll get an uh, improvement in that growth. And by the end of the season, maybe you have a more normal canopy. The vines that you really have to be more worried about are these ones that where shoot tips die. And especially if there's no regrowth from a lateral uh, those vines are the ones that uh, sometimes have a, more of a long-term effect and carryover uh, of, of that damage into uh, the following seasons. And I think it, the comment was that sometimes those really severe shoots, they'll generally, sh those cl clusters will shatter, but oftentimes these stunted shoots can, can go through bloom uh, that generally they're impacted. And so here you see a, a, what we call a normal vine having a pretty normal looking cluster with nice set, relatively uniform berries. But as, as you get uh, some of those stented shoots, you see more uh, a reduction in set, a reduction in cluster size, and then an overall kind of you know, loss of, of maybe productivity. Again, that, a lot of that, like Con said, is related to the fact that those vines really don't have a lot of uh, leaf area to support uh, the development. And so, again, you, you have to, uh, you sometimes get in this situation where, you know, here you see a very stunted shoot. It still has two clusters. If you leave these clusters on there, those vines then are overcropped. And then you, you potentially have a situation where again, you have a vine that, that's struggling, maybe have low reserves. And again, it may be further impacted in follow seasons. And again, we see, especially in some of these sites that have uh, the high potential for, for cold temperatures, uh, we see a lot of these severe vines, they do not recover. And again, I followed a few vineyards where the, they're just no, they recover to a certain point those xylem tissues are still damaged. The conductance in those vines are, 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 um, are compromised. You can develop a crop, you can thin and, and drop crop to what is appropriate for the canopy, but you can't get in a situation where then you get back to what you feel is a normal canopy. You put on a full crop. If you have another cold event, sometimes those vines will then go back and, and be um, be uh, stunted again. And so you go through these cycles. And so we've seen this in some of these spots. Again, there is a, a rootstock effect. There's a very strong varietal effect. And so for uh, on the central coast, it's, we see probably more damage with Chardonnay on this, some of these sites than other varieties. I did run across one of these many years ago where they finally decided that was it. They were going to graft the vineyard. And so my recommendation was to cut the, the trunks down until you saw what you thought was active tissue. And so they did that and they put on a uh, white Riesling, which generally is, is, is better in a lot of these situations. And that vineyard actually is, is still in production today. And that, that was a, a 98 planting. And so those are kind of some of the, the, the management things you have to think about is accessing the damage. And again, I have seen vineyards, uh, maybe the, the best scenario is where what Mark said is when they're severely damage, they just die. It's, it's hard when you've got, you know, 20 to 40% of the vines that are, that are, are, are damaged, the rest are growing normal. 
is how do you manage those? And so you really have to look at those. And I think you have to make a decision how damaged are those vines if it is a cold type injury. And, and the ones that are damaged, you have to cut, cut them back and retrain them. And if they don't sucker, you've got to replace those vines. So with that, maybe I'll turn it back to Con and we can open it up and hopefully have a discussion on some of these other issues. Great. So, um, so we have lots of questions, and uh, which is great. And I think uh, maybe if Anita, you you are there, we're going to uh, let you ask the first one. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we have a question that was sent in in advance. Um, somebody that have a vineyard in um, Canaris that's been hit hard from delayed growth and cold winter spring phenomena. And basically the question is about um, rootstock susceptibility. So they have both 420A and St. George, and they found that 420A have worse symptoms than St. George uh, growing in, in the same site. So Larry, I know you mentioned a little bit about 420A, but perhaps you can just compare 420A compared to St. George as far as sensitivity goes. Yeah, I, we did notice in our for our site that we were doing that experiment that 420 was more impacted than other uh, rootstocks. And again, it, it's kind of interesting um, because it's not a, a one that grows a real strong canopy or very vigorous shoot growth, but yet it was more impacted by by um, by the cold. I, I, I can't really say much to St. George because we, we have very little on the central coast. And so my experience with St. George is maybe less. Um, but I, there are a lot of those, um, I mean, rootstock can have a big effect. And so again, it's, it's in my experience has been 110R, 3309, 420A seems to have more issues and then for us, the 1103 seems to have the least amount. And so again, I would say maybe St. George might be more like the moderate to less impacted rootstock uh, based on parentage, maybe. Um, and again, I'm Matthew seeing the same thing um, in the Valley on, on Freedom. It's interesting that, that uh, things like Freedom uh, are in harmony uh, they grow very differently on the coast versus they do on the um, in the San Joaquin Valley. But again, we still saw the similar effect that they were stunted with freedom, but the recovery was better than let's say 110R or 3309. And so I assume some of that has to do with how those shoots are maturing, uh, maturing their wood in the, the, in the fall. Um, the other thing, you know, rootstock has an effect on, on activity in the springtime too. And so it might be how those, either those canes are becoming more acclimated in the fall, or also we, what we commonly see is sometimes with these warm uh, falls and winters, and then you have a rapid uh, reduction in temperatures, you know, the vines respond to some of that. And I think they come in and out of, um, activity. And so if you get caught and they're more active than they should be, you're going to see potentially damage to those vascular tissues. It's hard so to basically, assess. It's hard to assess that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's the interaction of rootstock and uh, environmental factors, basically. Someone Can mentioned I... in the chat that they saw big losses with uh, 1103P in Lake County. When it gets cold enough, they all get damaged. It, you know, so, and then we saw the same thing when we had odin rooted vines. You get a cold enough uh, scenario or the right, I mean, I've, I've worked with growers that had, they didn't do any post-harvest irrigation. So we went through some of these drought cycles and all of a sudden we got delayed spring growth. And so a lot of those, as we, we say, well, you need to maintain a certain level of moisture post-harvest and into the winter months, if it doesn't rain, those kind of symptoms typically go away in those vineyards. It's the, it's the years when you get these cold events and especially warm and cold events and the vines haven't acclimated properly that you get uh, vascular tissue damage. And those are the ones that are more problematic. And again, it's mostly with younger vines. 
we see less with mature vines. Thank you. I, I will say we do have a lot of questions and I know we're getting close to three o'clock, but hopefully our speakers will stay on a little bit longer um, to answer a few more questions. We'll, we'll keep going. Um, so this is a, another question from a participant. They had a frost event last fall in a newly planted vineyard. The vines had green leaves before the frost. After the frost, about 50% of the vines had almost complete burn on the leaves, but the other 50% were still just as green. The burn was randomly dispersed throughout a flat block with uniform soil. We didn't do a survey last fall, but this spring less than half sprouted at normal time. Some are, some are still pushing. Some appear to be dead. Would frost protection have helped prevent injury to the new vines? What practices in the vineyard would minimize frost damage under these circumstances in the future? Yeah, I, I think I can address that. Um, so the question, would, would frost protection practices have helped out in a situation like this? Uh, absolutely. And we're trying to prevent cold temperature damage. So anything we can do to mitigate the minimum cold temperatures experienced at the site, whether it be by running wind machines, if the conditions are right, if there's inversion conditions with the, say a radiation frost or radiation freeze, um, even to running sprinklers. Um, oftentimes we don't think about that, but there's other parts of the world where that's routinely done in the winters to prevent cold weather damage, such as up in Ontario. Um, the, in this particular example, the difference in symptoms observed with that fall frost may have well been an indicator of the different levels of acclimation of those vines. So the less acclimated vines may have shown that by having that visible frost damage. And that also may have been an indication then that those same vines may have been more susceptible to subsequent cold. So um, a, lot of, a lot of signs out there that maybe we can make sense of. We did get a third question that was emailed in, but I think you guys answered it and it has to do with that they have a part of their vineyard that developed clusters with no shoot growth. And so I think you guys had already sort of addressed that. There was a question along the lines of the frost shields. Does application of frost shield once per month on young dormant vines have any positive effects for preventing DSG or cane cracking or vine death? Um, in a previous life, uh, I worked a lot on uh, frost avoidance and uh, cold hardiness. Topical sprays or uh, exogenous sprays, um, these are uh, always uh, rate and uh, timing uh, dependent. But then uh, again, uh, like Mark said, the uh, acclimation of the uh, tissue is uh, what's more important. Uh, in California, we hardly go into endodormancy uh, except for some uh, region. So it is difficult to, uh, you know, assess the efficacy of these uh, sprays uh, in situ uh, in uh, California. So short answer, I do not know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, if they're uh, endodormant and if you're using a uh, frost shield, uh, you know, it would typically uh, work. But, uh, you know, we deacclimate uh, so fast in a grapevine uh, compared to other uh, crops, uh, it's very difficult to say how effective uh, they are uh, in our uh, Mediterranean climate. There's a, another question. Can, can the damage from cold happen anytime during dormancy or as close to dormancy as we're getting, as you were saying, or is the damage more likely to occur October through mid-December? It can happen uh, any time, uh, but uh, you need to uh, differentiate between uh, winter damage, which is usually a top-down uh, freeze, or uh, uh, early frost or uh, late spring uh, damage. Uh, the uh, damage is uh, related to uh, how much uh, water is in the tissue and uh, how much uh, you know total uh, non-structural uh, carbohydrates are in the uh, uh, bract of those uh, uh, enveloped uh, buds. So it's difficult to say, but uh, it can happen at any time. Okay, I have another question. Um, a question from Kenneth L. We notice affected vines push more suckers. Have you have found any correlation with the sucker, the sucker push? Sorry. So I assume between uh, delayed spring growth and sucker push? Has there been any correlation between those two events? 
I think seeing the suckers pushing is a good sign. Maybe they can be retrained. Uh, sucker push uh, usually happens uh, following a damage. It's usually a uh, you know internal uh, plant growth regulator uh, response. The uh, you know as like a, if you're like bending the shoot or if like a, there's like free start damage, suckers uh, will push out, no doubt about it. But uh, where the uh, suckers push out is the uh, more important issue. If it's uh, pushing out at the head or the uh, crown. I'd be like uh, worried about the rest of the cordon, uh, you know, being uh, you know intact the uh, rest of the season. If, if they're uh, pushing out, uh, you know, towards the uh, graft union, then you have like a mechanical uh, damage uh, to the whole structure of the vine due to a uh, freeze thaw damage. So it's uh, difficult to assess uh, without uh, seeing this uh, situation. Okay, thank you. All right, the next one is, uh, what about when late winter soil temperatures rise above 50 degrees Fahrenheit for extended periods, five to seven days, for example, with related high ambient air temps and then drop to low levels again? We saw late January, early February soil and air temps like this, then lows dropped to the low 20s almost immediately afterwards. Should we be frost protecting after these sorts of events, assuming that the vines have begun the process to break dormancy? Uh, the vines uh, never truly go dormant in uh, California. I mean, uh, so at that uh, point, uh, you know, uh, they are not really, uh, you know, endo dormant. So they're ready to uh, push out as soon as that, uh, you know, requirement of uh, chilling has been uh, met, which is uh, very low for uh, vinifera grapevines. But uh, yes, you should be uh, frost protecting uh, at those uh, events. But I'd be, I would not be uh, as worried about like uh, soil temperatures more so than I, you know, air temperatures and our light conditions are, you know, kickstarting this uh, process. So if air temperatures are uh, warm, soil will uh, eventually uh, warm up because we're usually, uh, you know, clean cultivated uh, these days due to our uh, red blotch uh, incidences uh, that we have seen in the last decade. Is, is there, there's another question from the chat. Is there any effective action that can be implemented after a cold hit in spring, like end of April, during bud burst. Um, is the question is there, can they do something like standard frost protection or have these vines already suffered from cold? Uh, I don't know, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it's, uh, uh, let's see, this person's commented more, no. Um, why don't we why don't we go with uh, uh, are there any things that you can do if you've had a freeze or cold event and didn't protect well enough? Yeah, no, that, that would be a good question. Um, so let's say we, we have a vineyard that did get frosted and we had appreciable growth at that time. Then you know the big question is well, what do you do? Do you uh, do an uh, manual breakdown breakout of the shoots to try to stimulate the vines to grow again as if they had gotten severely frosted and that way you'll have uniform growth or do you just sort of leave things as they are and you know i've, I've seen there's uh, uh different results have been achieved in different studies looking at that um you know again it's a kind of a question of do you spend the the labor to go through there early and say right after that freeze to do that manual breakout I mean, I think for a lot of people that can make sense to try to get more uniform growth later on and then just realize that you've got vines which have used up a lot of their storage carbohydrates. So you want to make sure you don't um, overcrop those vines for the rest of the season. Great. Okay, another question from the chat. Um, so you all mentioned carbohydrate reserves. What, when, and where do you measure them? And what levels should we look for? That's a complicated question. As usual, I'm <laughs> uh, I mean, your uh, biggest carbohydrate uh, reserve is your uh, trunk and uh, your roots. But the way uh, we typically measure them is uh, pruning mass. Uh, so your pruning mass is going to be an uh, indicator of uh, how much uh, carbohydrate uh, you were able to uh, store. 
in this case. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, uh, there's a you know, direct relationship between this uh, carbohydrate accumulated and then a, a natural abundance of uh, carbon-13 in the musts. So instead of uh, you know, taking uh, like all these uh, other measurements, uh, you could do this uh, at the end of the season uh, once. It's just a juice sample uh, you sent to a stable isotope lab at uh, UC Davis for $7.50. And uh, you'll have a good idea of uh, what situation uh, you had the whole season, uh, how, these, uh, how well these vines have uh, grown. So, uh, that would be the, uh, you know, measurement I would use instead of uh, taking, uh, you know, repeated uh, uh, measurements of uh, pruning mass or uh, stem water potentials, et cetera. So the R square uh, we achieve uh, between these is like uh, in the point of uh, 0.89 to uh, 0.92. Uh, it's calibrated across the whole state of California. So it's a very reliable uh, measure to uh, do this in that uh, manner. So like I said, if the abundance of this is uh, around uh, negative 25 and a half to a uh, negative 26, I would uh, certainly uh, push some uh, water uh, post harvest to uh, recuperate these uh, vines. And then uh, uh, hopefully I will make enough uh, leaf area to, uh, you know, rejuvenate them. And then I, uh, you know, go into, uh, you know, uh, dormant season uh, a lot healthier. So our recommendation is to, uh, you know, keep it around like a, uh, well, 12 and a half, 13 percent of our reference uh, ET uh, to give the uh, water to it. So they do not get uh, over uh, vigorous going into the uh, dormant uh, season. So it has uh, worked well for us uh, at, our, at the uh, vineyards uh, that we manage uh, at the University of California. So, and we are uh, very frost prone where we are uh, at, at, we're at the uh, bottom of the uh, hills uh, in the uh, flat parts of, uh, you know, central portion of uh, Napa Valley. So this year uh, we had to uh, protect 13 times. Uh, we had to turn on our uh, wind machines uh, 13 times. And uh, we came out uh, you know, uh, quite well uh, using the, these uh, approaches at our uh, facilities at our uh, University of California. All right, so the next question is, any thoughts on a temperature to which we should protect i.e. if it's going to be below 27 degrees, assuming no actual bud break, we should protect, but if it's gonna be 32 to 27 as a forecast low, no frost protection will be required, and that's a question mark. Winter could get really long and expensive if we need to protect dormant wood when it gets below 32 degrees. Any comments to that comment? <laughs> that's a mark question. Well, my, I mean, I, I would focus, you know, where your risk is the worst. So young vines, especially young vines where at, at uh, let's say dormancy, you maybe already have clues that those vines could be very susceptible to suffering cold damage. Um, if you have a situation where, you know, based on, uh, you know, Khan's comment of, you know, how much, what you look like your, your pruning weights might be and older vines, especially in sites where cold damage isn't likely to happen, then we don't need to focus our resources there. As far as exactly what temperature, you know, actually, you know, 27 below 27 might be temperatures that you need to be paying attention to. Um, I think temperatures above that uh, will be far less likely to have severe damage. So I, I think given the time, I'm gonna ask one more question and the rest of the questions will We'll collect those questions. We'll get answers from our experts and post them on uh, social media and so forth for you um, and to all the participants. But so here's the last question. Is there a correlation with more fibrous uh, stocks having more damage? I'll tackle that. Um... Uh, 10114 is the most uh, fibrous uh, rootstock we grow, uh, or that's commercially uh, marketed, and uh, it's not really uh, adapted to uh, California. So yes, there's uh, more damage uh, associated with uh, 10114 uh, rootstocks compared to uh, you know uh, sturdier uh, rootstock like uh, 110R, for example. Uh, the reason uh, there's more damage associated uh, with those is that uh, since 10114 uh, you know uh, reaches deep below, but it will uh, fail under conditions of uh, longer uh, prolonged uh, droughts. The reason uh, there's more damage associated with that is that uh, it's not making enough uh, carbohydrates to uh, get through the season because the sinks 
the clusters are uh, taken over uh, in that case, and as opposed to like, you know, putting it uh, back into the roots, the leaves already are shoots already are trunk. So the assumption uh, in this case is uh, correct. Great. So I think with that, given it's 312, I think we're, we're going to end the program. We will get answers to the rest of the questions um, so that uh, we can send them out to all our reg registered um, uh, participants and hopefully get them on online as well. Um, so with this, that I'd like to uh, just take a moment to thank Con, Matt, Mark, and Larry for terrific uh, presentations and for answering questions from our uh, participants. Um, I'd also like to thank our extension and industry relation partners that you see here on the screen right now. Without their support, we can't do programs like this. And, um, and so I hope you appreciate their support. If you would like to become one of our partners for extension, please uh, contact, uh, you can contact me or Karen or Caroline, and we can help you uh, to do that, to become a partner. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Karen and Caroline for organizing this program, along with Khan coming up with the idea, inviting our speakers. Um, so thank you to, uh, to all of them. And again, thank you for, for listening and being part of this program. Our next program, um, office hours program will be in late July on uh, fermentation readiness, especially in environment of potential smoke. And that will be, I think is it July 27th, Karen? Yes. July 27th. Yeah. So you'll get notices for that pretty soon. So thanks again for your attention. Um, and have a great day. Please take a moment you, to everyone. complete the survey uh, in the chat box. Yep, as you're leaving. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.